Hello and welcome to United Church Online. We're so glad that you decided to join us today. If you are new to United Church, why don't you fill in the Connect card in the description or visit our website for more information. So let's ready our Bibles, notebooks and pens as we get ready to receive the word together. Cool, go ahead and grab your seats. So I'm going to take some time and zoom out for a second because when you read the scriptures, what you'll realize is that from the beginning, when God instituted his nation, you see the nation of Israel forming around the book of Exodus, when he begins to form a nation for himself. He calls them his very own possession. And around that time, you realize that God has this desire for his presence to dwell amongst these people. Obviously, going back to Genesis 3, when God's presence was in the garden and people kind of were, you know, Adam and Eve were together with God and then sin came in and separated that. And so from then, God has this desire to dwell amongst these people. But obviously, God being a holy God, he cannot dwell among sin. So he constantly tried to create ways for him to dwell with us. And we see around Exodus chapter 40, God giving Moses this idea to build what's called a tabernacle, which is kind of like just a, you know, interesting word for like a little kind of building kind of outline, but it, they didn't have buildings, so it was like a tent. So it's like build this thing, and how it was meant to work is it's a space where God's presence dwells that represents that God is in the midst of his people. And so Moses sets out and he builds this tabernacle. It's, you know, stretched tent and it's got different sections that represent a whole lot. Um, I won't get into the detail now. And around verse 34, it says this, then after he built this tabernacle, the cloud covered the tabernacle. The cloud was representative of God's presence. It says the cloud covered the tabernacle and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses could no longer enter the tabernacle because the cloud had settled over it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And so you see at this moment, um, up until this point, people never really encountered God's presence like this, you know. And suddenly this cloud descends upon this place and the presence of God fills it. And obviously from the Old Testament, what we realize is that whenever God's presence fills a place like that, people weren't allowed to just enter it. You know, there were all sorts of things they had to do in order to enter God's presence. And that is the beginning of God beginning to make this way and say, this is how I'm going to dwell among you. I'm going to be with you and this will be the space that separates you and I, but I'm still there with you, right? And we see later on, fast forward, David wants to build a temple for God, not just the tabernacle, but the temple. And God says, you can't build this temple because you've got blood on your hands. You are a man of war. David fought many battles. And he said, okay, I'm going to give your son this privilege. Your son is going to build my temple. And so we see later on Solomon builds the temple. And when you do the study, you'll realize it's very much laid out around the same structure as the tabernacle. It's got certain sections. And one section is called the Holy of Holies, which is the innermost section of the, of the temple where that's the place reserved for God's presence. And in Second Chronicles chapter 7, it says this, when Solomon was finished praying, after he had built the building, uh, built the temple, when he was finished praying and dedicating it to God, fire flashed down from heaven and burnt up the offerings and sacrifices and the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could no longer enter the temple because the glorious presence of the Lord filled it. And when all the people of Israel saw the fire coming down and the glorious presence of the Lord filling his temple, they fell face down on the ground and worshipped and praised the Lord saying, He is good. His faithful love endures forever. And so that's fast forwarding in the history of Israel. That's a new moment where it's like, oh wow, God's presence is now here in a different way. It's now in the temple, not in the tabernacle anymore. And um, when we fast forward again, we see when that temple is destroyed and they rebuild it in the book of Ezra, a similar thing happens as well. But the point of all of this is that there's always this, this, this linear narrative where God wants a space to be with his people. And sin separated us from that, but God was adamant that I want to be with my people. I don't just want to, you know, kind of be limited. I don't just want to be in a specific location. I want to dwell among them. And you realize this temple became the, the central point for all the Israelites. They would come from far and wide and they needed to visit the temple. So every time when they are scattered once a year, they needed to come to the temple, make sacrifices, celebrate. They would have a whole feast. The temple was really the centerpiece of their culture. 
Everybody who was Jewish needed to make a pilgrimage once a year. Everything centered around the temple. It was so important to them. That's why when the temple got destroyed, it's almost like you destroyed their culture. You destroyed the center of everything they believed in. People came from far and wide. The point was, we're going to the house of God. We're going where the presence of God dwells. It's important to us. But then fast forward to the New Testament and you realize something is different. There's no longer a temple. The temple was destroyed after the death and resurrection of Jesus, um, 70 AD. And now there's a whole different kind of setup. How come the temple was so central and now suddenly it's completely different and we realize no longer are people flocking to the temple to encounter the presence of God. Um, something powerful has happened. The Holy Spirit descends upon his people and they become carriers of God's presence. They now start to carry God's presence. They start to be the people who are filled with God, God's presence. And we no longer have to flock to a specific place. The nature of the space completely changes. In fact, when Peter, uh, is it Peter speaks, uh, Paul, he speaks to the Athenians in Greece. And they had their temples, you know, their pagan temples. And they would worship their gods. And then he speaks to them in Acts 17 and he says, this God, let me introduce you to this God. He is the God who made the world and everything in it. And since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples. Hang on, that's different. Because there was a time when we made temples for his presence. And the presence of God descended and it was amazing. And now suddenly he doesn't live in man-made temples. He says he doesn't live in man-made temples and um, the human, human hands can't serve his needs for he has, more, so he has no more needs. He himself, give, he himself gives life and breath to everything and he, testif and he satisfies every need. So how do we go from one season where everything was centered around the temple to another season where God doesn't dwell in temples? It's because the nature of a change, we are now carriers of the Spirit of God, and we have become a physical temple. 1 Peter 2 verse 5, and you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. And what's more, you are his holy priests. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. Here's the parallel. This is what's fascinating. There was a time when everybody ran towards the temple and suddenly things changed, and now everybody moves from the temple into the world. God fills us up when we are together so that we can be effective ministers outside. And so the nature isn't come to this place because this is the only place where the presence of God dwells. It's now come to this place that you are empowered to be his temple outside of this place. And so the nature of church is completely different to what we see in the Old Testament, before the temple was the destination, now God's church is the departure point. When this was once the destination, everybody ran to it. Now it's the place that we come to, are filled up, are equipped, are given life, and then we run from it because there's a community that needs God's presence. Have you, do you see that? It's so fascinating from it being the central place to it being the place where we come to are equipped, empowered to be disciples and make disciples and then leave from here. See, what the church of God is today is that it's the hub, right? It's the hub from which God chooses to transform everyone and everything around us. I hope we see this, that God's church is no longer the kind of thing. And I know many people have made this excuse. They're like, you know what? I don't need to go to church to be a Christian because God dwells in me. A part of that is true. It's partly true. But we still need the church because that's the space that God chooses to use to bring transformation through us. It's kind of like how your car is your vehicle to get you to where you need to be, but it needs to be filled up. Good luck trying to get to where you need to be without filling it up. You and I are empowered. We are equipped to be God's vehicles of change and transformation in a community and a nation that really needs it more than ever. Yeah. And so this morning, my, my, if I can be brutally honest and share my heart, church, God didn't say, I will build my 
non-profit organization. God didn't say, I will build my municipality and they will bring change in, in the nation. He didn't say, I'm going to build my government institution and they will bring change. No, God said, I will build my church. The local church is the hope of the world because the local church can do what no other institution can do for us. Yes, we've got other forms of institutions that bring, you know, a bit of help to it, but nothing can do what the church can do, and that is to transform the condition of the human heart. Listen, it would be amazing if government could do that. It would be amazing if you pay your taxes, and in return, government just changes the nature of your heart. But that's not what they're there for. They're just there to bring some sort of civil order to a society, but they do not change the nature of the human heart. Only the church does that. And that's why the church is so needed. Because God can do in a person what nothing else can do outside of what God's power can do in us. And so we need this more than we realize. And so when it comes to things like making room, this is the reason why I firmly believe in this. When it comes to things like making room, when it comes to the church, I mean, it's, it's weird because I'm the pastor, I'm supposed to say this, but this is a deep-rooted belief of mine, is that we don't choose to make room, we don't choose to invest into the church just because we want a bigger church. We choose to invest because we realize when we do this, we become more effective at doing what God calls us to do. We don't expand and grow because we want to be more comfortable, Right? And, and I know many people, and we live in a, the 21st century, it's very difficult to come to church without air conditioning. You're going to sit here, or you're going to sit here and get hot. I see how many people fan themselves sometimes. Like, it's, it's nice to have a space that is convenient, but we don't come for our comfort. Yeah. We don't come for convenience. We don't come to be settled. No, this is the place we come to, to grow, right? To be filled up, to be equipped and empowered so we can be effective beyond these walls. That's the reason for the church to be effective disciples and disciple makers. Those two things happen simultaneously. As we become disciples, we also become disciple makers because we all know there's always room for growth. We should always be growing, right? There's nothing that we get to, we never get to the point where we stagnate. I've always got work to do in my marriage. I've always got work to do as a father. I've always got work to do in terms of what I do in my career. I've always got work to be doing and the church always helps me do that. Because God empowers us. We can be effective witnesses and we can become more effective as Christ followers and as disciple makers. So, let me paint this picture for you. There was a time in the Old Testament, people ran to the temple, they encountered the presence of God, they went home. Parallel that with the journey today, most people, most people, when in times of need, know that there's a local church I can run to. So many of us, we found the church because there was, there was a need in our lives. Something happened. I, I realized I need this. I, I need God. I need something. And so what happens is we run to the church. We encounter God. And then from there we turn around and God equips us. And then we run from the church into the world. If we're always running to the church... And we never get to that point where we turn around and run back to the world. We've only fulfilled half the equation. If we're always coming to church just for us, if it's always us that needs something, or if it's always us that need transformation, there's something that we haven't realized that God isn't just supposed to work in us. He's supposed to work through us. Right? So we're only fulfilling half of the role of what the church is. I'm running to this place, but at some point God does something in me where I realize, God, you can work in me, but also as I begin to leave, you can work through me. Look at that parallel. So you and I realize that there's a community that at some point are going through some difficult parts of their life and they might not have the knowledge to say, let me run to the church because sometimes, let's be honest, guilt and shame stop us, right? Many people find themselves in this place where they're like, what if? Now, what if I get the, what if there's judgment? What, what if I'm not accepted like I thought I would be? What, what, if, what if I'm not heard the right way? There's all these insecurities. People are going through, people are going through heavy things out there. I always keep hearing stories of the hurt and pain that people are going through, marriage disputes, families, abuse, all of these things. People are going through uncertainty. People are worried as to what's happening with our future. People are in dire financial need. 
there's people living with completely empty souls everywhere. The more I encounter it, the more it gives me a burden that we should be the church. There's so many people living without hope, living without a cause, living without a purpose. There's so many people whose relationships are in turmoil. And here's the thing. You and I might have at some point summed up the courage and say, let me run to the church. But for them, they're sitting there and saying, I can't sum up that courage. And so they just sit in it. They just sit in it. But when you and I have that revelation that God, they might never run here, but I can run there. They might never run here, but I can run to them. And I can be the light, and I can be the hope, and I can bring courage, and I can bring words of wisdom, I can bring words of encouragement, and I can be the church to them. Then we are fulfilling that equation. We've run to the church, and then we run from the church, having been empowered by God's presence. If I were to ask you this morning, and if you were to be brutally honest, where do you stand on that equation? Are you the, are you the someone who is still in the season of running to the church? Maybe you, you're new to Christianity, you're still new to this, maybe you've just started coming and you're thinking, you know what, I still need God. I'm fixing a bunch of things in my life, I'm still figuring things out, I don't have it all together yet. Maybe that's you, maybe you're still running to the church. Maybe some of us have gotten to a point where we've run to the church, but we've kind of ended there, and we're still just running to the church. Some of us might have figured that equation out and we started running from the church. But we need to realize that that equation has to come a full circle. Where if I'm the new person coming to the church, God eventually works in me. If I'm the person that has come to the church but I've stayed, I need to sum up the courage to do the other part and then be, begin to become a witness to others. And so I need to make room for that. If I don't make room for that, it's not just going to happen. We need to make room to be those people. We need to prepare for it. We need to say, God, what's next in my life? I can't just keep coming and coming and coming and my life stays the same. Something needs to happen in me and I need to make room to be the other half of what the church is meant to be beyond these walls. And so this morning, I want to give us four things that we need to make room for. If we're going to fulfill this equation, if we're going to continue to be the church, four things we need to make room for. Number one, are you still okay? Yeah. Great. Number one, make room for others. That's where it starts. Make room for others. Make room for others in your life and make room for yourself, your life, to infiltrate the lives of others. I remember I came to this revelation when I just started as a staff member at church. Um, I've always wanted to work for church. Um, I used to volunteer here. I spent a year of my life unpaid volunteering at the church because this is where I really believe God called me to be. And so I spent all of my time here. Every waking moment, if I've got free time, I came here, I volunteered, I served, I helped, I did all of those things. But at some point I remember realizing I've got no friends outside of this place. And it, it wasn't like a, a, a bad thing, but I just realized, God, how am I being effective? as a Christian, when all the people I know are in these four walls, I'm no longer being an effective Christian. I don't know anyone that doesn't know you. I'm not bridging a gap. I'm not, I'm not finding myself in the space of those who don't believe. And I've got no people who don't believe finding themselves in my space. God, am I really being effective at this? And I had to be brutally honest. As someone who worked and was paid by the church, I had lost the mission of the church. And God had to do a work in me. And I had to start making room. And I started doing all sorts of things. I'd go jogging so I could meet other people and, and make my way into their lives. And I started making friends who weren't Christian. And those were some of the most life-giving seasons because then God began to renew the desire for why we do what we do. Because as I become friends, I'm not being a friend with an agenda. I'm genuinely being a friend because I want to draw close to you. And so for you and I, do we make room for others, not just superficially, not just with an agenda, I'm, I'm just being your friend because I want to get you into this place, but to genuinely be in the lives of others, for me to be a voice of hope and a voice of meaning, deeply and authentically. Here's a challenge for you. If you've been coming to United Church, let's, let's give it a time frame, let's say about one year. If you've been coming to United Church for more than one year, and you still don't have any authentic relationships in the church, can I encourage you? You are missing the point of what church is meant to be. 
If you still come in and go out, you know those people last in, first out? Yeah, I'm calling you out. I'm calling you out. If you're still one of those people, we're missing the point. Right? We're missing the point of what we've been commissioned for. The point is that this is the place where we are equipped and encouraged and empowered with one another so we can be effective out there. There's so much more to church than just a sermon. Listen, genuinely, and I mean this, I'm not being mean, I'm, I'm being frank. If the sermon is all we want to hear, this sermon goes online. Pick it up there. See, that we're not just coming to hear a sermon, we're coming to encounter something. We're coming to have something imparted into us. There is an impartation that happens in the presence of God and community, right? There's a transformation that only happens within the presence of God and His community. So it's not just transactional. It's not just sermon and go. It's like God in this time, as I worship with people, God begins to speak to me. God, give me a word for someone. Give me a word for someone in my life. Give me a word for someone in the room. You know how many people have come up to me afterwards, after worship, and said, listen, while we were worshiping, I had this vision. And God showed me this, and God showed me that, and I'm like, man, it would be nice. I, I would love to get visions like that. Other people come, Pastor Randy, last night I had a dream. I don't know what that means, but when I sat in worship, I realized the dream I had was related to this space, and suddenly they're piecing it together, and God begins to speak to his church about his church. That's when we realize it's not just about us anymore, hey? We begin to make room for others. So that's the thing we need to do. We need to make room for others. The second thing is this. Still okay? Yes, sir. Number two, we need to make room to grow. Growth doesn't just fall into your lap. We need to make room for it. Right? We need to make room to grow and continue growing. 2 Peter chapter 3. Rather, you must grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. All glory to Him now and forever. What are you doing to grow in your faith? Not just be able to say, I'm a Christian, but what are you doing to grow in your faith, in your understanding of God's word, grow in your desire of God's word, grow in your worship, growing at being effective, um, at making disciples or being an effective disciple in yourself. What are we doing to grow? Because that won't just happen. Anybody who's built a career knows there's a bit of, you need to put a bit of a time into it, right? Some companies have that thing where they always send you on these courses where you have to like update it every year, every two years, renew your certification, renew your license. Why? So you can keep growing. Every year, my, my, the kids, my, uh, school, my school my kids go to, Emmanuel Private School as well. They, um, every year they close the school for, for a day and all the teachers still go on training. I'm like, come on, man, you did this last year. It's like, yeah, but we need to do it every year. Why? We need to keep growing. If companies and corporate spaces are so intentional about growth, what are we doing as Christians to grow our faith? Do we tell ourselves that, you know what, this year I'm going to do something different. This year I'm going to attend a conference. I want to grow. This year I'm going to take up a Bible reading challenge. I'm going to try and read through the Bible in a year. This year I'm going to do a few more devotionals. This year I'm going to buy a book outside of the Bible so it parallels to me growing in my knowledge. This year I'm going to do something different so I can grow. What are we doing to grow. How effective are we at fulfilling the Great Commission? How effective are we at understanding the Word of God? Not just being content with someone else teaching it to me. How, if, how, how effective am I at learning to understand it? How effective am I at growing my marriage? Understand that if I've got a better marriage, we can be stronger together to make an impact beyond these four walls. Or are we just kind of like glorified roommates? That's not what we want to be. We want to be effective. We want this marriage to be effective for the kingdom of God. How, how better can I grow as a husband, as a father? When last did I pick up a book and say, let me read about fatherhood. Maybe there's something I can learn. When last did you read a book about leadership to expand your leadership capability for you to take on more responsibility? Does this make sense? We need to be people who always seek to be growing. Grow in your church attendance. If you're one of those one to skip a few people, just say to yourself, for the next year, I commit to coming. If I, if I come two out of four times a month, let me come three out of four times a month. And then one day, four out of four times a month. Woo, Jesus, help me. It's like I spend the whole day at church. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <laughs> make room in your time so that you can make room to grow. Invest in some life-giving relationships, all of these things, we need to make room for them. They won't just happen. They need intentionality. Amen. Amen. Number three, Amen. make room in your giving. See, all of this 
is important and giving is such an important part of our discipleship. It was never God's intention for one person to take full responsibility for his church. When I, when I go back to the story of the temple, David commissions the temple and David gives an insane amount. I mean, when you go read the narrative, um, it's ridiculous what David gave. Tons and tons of gold, silver, multiple, like everything. He just gave. But still, where the temple was built, people still contributed. Because it was never meant to be one person that does all the work. God meant for the church to build the church. Yeah. Right? Yes. It was always meant to be the people carry the weight of this. Not one person carries the weight of this. It would be great if we had like one person saying, hey, I'll give you guys a million rand a month so you can do what you do. It's like, that's amazing, but that's not God's intention. Look, if you have a million a month, please go for it. I'm not stopping you. Um, that'll be amazing. But it's, it's, it's the fact that the body carries the weight. That your little bit and your little bit. It's not about the amount. It's about saying, this is what I can do. If I can give that much and my that much combined with your that much and your that much, together we've got more to work from. Right? That amount that we have, that, that average giving of 204, think about what your contribution is. Alone, you couldn't do that. But together, that's what we're doing. That's what the church is meant to be. From the first tabernacle to the temple, people always gave and they gave extravagantly. Look at Acts, uh, the book of Acts chapter 2. It says this, a deep sense of awe came over all of them and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions. They shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together in the temple each day and met in homes for the Lord's Supper. They were empowered and equipped and then they met together. Do you see the pattern? They shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of people. And each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. So in that, all of that, it was a combination. They made time for each other. They made time for the temple. They were generous. They gave to one another. When they were together, nobody had any need or any lack. That's what a picture of what the church is. You and I need to make room in our giving. Don't, don't stretch yourself so thin that there's no room for you to be generous to your community of faith. Don't live on the edge. I know we live in South Africa. The statistics tell us that an average of 80% plus of people live on the edge of their salary line. But... If you and I simply apply the biblical principles, we can set a different trajectory for that. We can be the people who make room, scale down, make some room in your life, sell something that you don't need so that you've got more margin in order to be more generous. People think the thought of scaling down is like, you know, why should I move backwards? It's like, it's like I'm not progressing in life. No, scaling down can be wise when you're making room for something even bigger. I firmly believe that. And so it's important for you and I to analyze our lives. What have we got? Where can we scale down? How can we be the people to make room in this? And finally, before I wrap up the last one, make room for the presence of God. And, and here's the point. Here's the crux of what I'm wanting to come to. We can, shoo, it's going to get emotional. Church, we can spend our lives building buildings that is void of the presence of God. We can, we can put time, we can put effort, we can put energy into something and God still says to us, I was never in that. One of the saddest things we can do is invest all of our lives into something only for Jesus to say, I wasn't a part of that. You did that on your own. Have a look at the scriptures when, when the disciples say, you know, Jesus says, some people will come to me at the end and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do great things in your name? We cast out demons. We did miracles. And Jesus says, I never knew you. Not once did you live in my presence. You did good things, good for you, but my presence was not a part of that. See, because like I said in the beginning, we were meant to be carriers of God's presence. That every step we take, presence of God goes with us we don't want to be the people who build great and significant things and God is like I was never there you did you ran ahead with this and you left me behind every decision we make does it flow from the presence of God when you need to make tough decisions in your life who are you going to marry where are you going to move what job are you going to take do you make room to hear from God in his presence or do we just make the decision for what will give us most money or what will give us closer to our dreams. Do we make room for God's presence? 
See, the reason why this is important is because at the end of the day, if we are going to be carriers of God's presence into our community, there needs to be time and space in our lives for God to be able to speak to us, for us to hear His voice, and for us to act in obedience. The only time you can act in obedience is when you've heard God instruct you. And the only time we hear God instruct us is when we make room to hear from Him. And so I'm turning up the heat a little bit because I'm not content for settling for a church that is simply transactional. I'm not content to settle. I know the stats look beautiful. When you look at the church on face value, according to statistics, everybody would think like, this church is great. But here's my deep conviction. Until all of us are there, we are not there yet. And I'm not okay with leaving people behind. That's not what leaders do. Leaders say, hey, some of us might be there, but for the rest of us, let's get moving. It's not okay for us to just come and say, you know, I'm just going to, you know, I've got an hour. Let's quickly go to the 8 a.m. and carry on with my life. No, no, no. This needs to be the place where my, my, life, my life centers around this. This needs to be the space where if there's any life-giving relationships, they stem from here. If I'm going to be serving, this is the space where I'm going to be serving because my gifts and talents are outworked here. And I've done so with God leading me from His presence. We need to make room to encounter God's presence daily. Not weekly. Not monthly, not once, twice a month. Daily, church. Every day. The more I spend time with God, the more I realize how much I need to spend time with God. Yes. Make room for His Word. You know, statistics tell us that the, 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 the region of 60 to 70 percent, I think it's less than that, 50 to 60 percent of Christians actually read their Bible. Actually read their Bible. Many don't. Many are okay with reading it on the screen on a Sunday. Can we not be those people? Can we be the people who say, you know what, God? We want to actually encounter you. See, we've created room. We've done everything we can as a, as a church organization. We have prayer night once a month. We're making room to push into the presence of God. We make room for worship so that you can hear from God. We make room for extended prayer so you can hear from God. We can make the room, but you need to fill it. We can only do so much. I can only create a space. But it's us that decides how close to God we want to get. And here's a firm revelation I believe in. We get as much of God as what we want. Amen? Amen. I feel like I'm shouting. I'm really not. I'm passionate. <laughs> Colored people get weird when they're passionate. But can, can you hear my heart? I, I hope my heart is coming through. Long before we decide what we're going to give, long before we decide what our financial contribution is going to be, the most important thing is that, that we decide that, God, we're going to do this together, whatever this looks like. And so for the next few minutes, I'm going to pray. We've got 10 minutes left. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. And here's what's going to happen. We, we're going to, I'm going to pray. We're going to worship. And afterwards, I'm going to come up. And in this time, this is a good opportunity for you to think about two things. Number one, what's your contribution going to be? But number two, what are you trusting God for? What are you trusting God for? What area do you want to grow in? What are you trusting God to do in you and your family's lives? What are you trusting God to accomplish over the next year? I hope you've given this some thought. God, this is where we want to go. Don't just think material. God, we want to buy a house or a car. Those are beautiful things. But God, what do we want to accomplish in the next year? God, I want to buy a house, but also I want to grow in your word. God, we're trusting you for a car, but at the same time, God, we're trusting you for a stronger marriage. In the book, you'll find a little card. If I can find mine. It looks like this. Grab it. Can I encourage you? Fill it in. And afterwards, when the offering baskets come past, for those of you who have come prepared to give, you can slot your giving in there, but I'd love to get, have you slot these in. And, and here's what I'll say. If you haven't made a decision yet, you are welcome to take this home and think about it. Don't make an impulsive decision. Pray through it. Spend time in God's presence and say, God, what do you want me to give? God, what do you want us to trust you for? And then over the next, we're going to do this throughout the month of, um, of November. You're welcome to bring it back at any point in the month. Pop it into the offering and say, 
this is what we've decided to do. Can we do that together? And then afterwards, afterwards, here's what I'm excited about. Afterwards, when we're done, I'm going to read you some verses that I specifically believe God has given us as a prophecy over our church. And I want to read them prophetically so that we all understand where God is taking us. Amen. This is what I'm most excited about. Whew, fantastic. Okay. Are we ready to worship? Great. Some of you, you can sit down. You can remain seated. You don't have to stand. This is just the team singing over us, but this is the time for us to connect with God, spend time in His presence. Once you've made a decision, you fold in your card, then you're welcome to stand and worship. But this is just a moment of connection with God's presence. We trust this message was helpful to you. We'd love for you to stay in touch. So follow us on Instagram at United Church SA or contact us on our WhatsApp number. Be blessed.